joining. Um, now, today I'm honored to introduce our first Grand Round speaker, Dr. Janelis Gonzalez. Uh, Dr. Gonzalez was born and raised in Hialeah, Florida. She attended the Florida International University for her undergraduate studies, uh, where she graduated summa cum laude. Later, she went on to complete medical school at the FIU Herbert Wartheim College of Medicine. Uh, following graduation, she moved to Gainesville, Florida to complete her residency in internal medicine, also being part of the clinical educator track at the University of Florida. She was then selected to fulfill the role of ambulatory chief resident and then moved back to Miami to become assistant professor of medicine at our university. Uh, in less than a year into her new faculty position, she was offered the position of associate program director at the University of Miami Jackson Memorial Hospital Internal Medicine Residency Program. Uh, she has a strong passion for academic internal medicine, medical education, curriculum development, and helping residents to achieve their highest potential as leaders and clinical educators. We're very lucky to have her as our associate program director and Dr. Gonzalez. Thank you so much, Antonio. I really appreciate it. That was a very kind introduction. Um, so uh, as Antonio mentioned, I'm kind of one of the newer faculty over at the Desai Sethi Clinic. I'm a primary care physician um, by practice. Um, so I am going to be I'm excited and ultimately nervous, to be honest, about talking to you guys about the pharmacologic management of obesity in the primary care setting. Um, so we'll just go ahead and jump right in. So for disclosures, I have none. Um, perhaps I have a small caveat, which is that I am not an obesity medicine doctor. I am a primary care doctor that gets these questions a lot from her patients. Um, and when thinking about a great grand rounds topic, I figured that this would be um, one of those topics that would really go across the board. Um, you know, we're going to see these medications a lot in the future, and I'll talk to you guys about why. So today, um, what we're going to do is we're going to describe the social and economic impact of obesity very briefly. We're going to list the multifaceted ways that we can treat obesity, discuss specifically FDA-approved anti-obesity medications for weight loss and their mechanisms of action, as well as identify some common side effects of anti-obesity medications. So why focus on this topic? So um, <clears throat> from 1999 to about uh, 2000 through 2017 to 2020, the prevalence of obesity in the U.S. has increased from about 31% to almost 42% within the entire United States. Um, the estimated annual cost of, of caring for obesity in the United States was um, was about 173 billion with a B dollars in 2019, which is quite impressive. Uh, the medical cost for adults who had obesity was almost $2,000 higher than medical cost for people of healthy weight. And as I mentioned before, I get a lot of questions about this from patients. So this is just part of the needs that we have to address with our patients as well. So as always, we'll start with a case. So this is my own personal um, patient. I'm going to call her MP. She's a 38-year-old female. She presented to me for her annual visit. She has a past medical history of prediabetes. She has hyperlipidemia, but not currently on a statin therapy. And she has obesity with a BMI of 32. Um, she expresses a lot of frustration with her inability to lose weight. She's been doing all the right stuff. So she's um, done lifestyle modifications, multiple diets, including Weight Watchers, ketogenic diet, Atkins diet, intermittent fasting, you name it, and she's done it. And she's exercising about five days a week. She's doing moderate intensity, uh, 30 to 35 minutes a day, including cardio and strength training throughout the, the, the week as well. And she's been doing this for over six months, and she kind of just wants to discuss her weight loss options. So I typically start this discussion with our overall zoomed out approach of obesity, right? So we start with diet and lifestyle modifications. If after six months, usually none, you know, we don't see a, an appropriate effect, roughly three to 3%, three we will start to discuss anti-obesity medications at that time. And depending on where patients are within their, their weight loss journey, honestly, some of them are interested in things like bariatric surgery or endoscopic weight loss procedures. So I kind of um, will personalize it depending on where patients are. Um, I only have 20 minutes, so I really can't get too, in too far into all of these approaches. So what we're really going to do today is focus a lot on anti-obesity medications. I'm specifically going to go through four medications and one upcoming medication um, that are approved for long-term use by the FDA. They're deemed to have a moderate or large magnitude of weight loss, and they are considered to have small or not substantial harms, which essentially balances out to favor their utilization more than anything, according to um, some of the guidelines. Um, furthermore, these four drugs are uh, associated with lifestyle interventions are shown to at least cause a five to 10% total body weight loss, which is the sort of the metric that we look at to really show um, favorable effects on long-term health outcomes. 
So where did I go for these medications? So I looked at two um, uh, large papers that are the majority of my presentation. So in 2022, the AGA uh, developed these guidelines um, for pharmacological interventions for adults with obesity in response to the underuse of anti-obesity medications um, amidst the relatively mounting uh, evidence from randomized control trials showing that these agents actually work. Um, so they wanted to essentially put everything together in one paper to try to guide people, uh, guide physicians to use this more effectively and stop underusing these medications. The AJMC article, on the other hand, was sort of a way to consolidate all of the guidelines with updates since 2017, which was the last time the obesity um, guidelines were reviewed again. So I get this question a lot, when do we consider medications? So not just from my patients, but also from my residents, you know, at which point do we say the, these lifestyle interventions um, aren't working and when do we start medication? So according to the AGA guidelines, in adults with obesity, or if they have, are overweight with a rate-related complication, we've and they've had inadequate response to lifestyle interventions, that's usually about three to 5%, they haven't reached that. It's recommended to add pharmacological agents to lifestyle interventions, as opposed to just continuing lifestyle interventions. According to the FDA and the Endocrine Society, anybody with a BMI of at least 27 who have at least one weight-related complication, or if there is a BMI of at least 30, we should really be considering it. So all this effectively to say that we're really underutilizing these medications as a whole. There's a lot of patients that are likely candidates and should at least have that discussion. The other thing, another caveat I kind of want to give here and something that I underlined for my patients is all the statistics I'm going to present to you in terms of the total body weight loss are in association with continuing diet and lifestyle modification. So it's very important to underline that. These are not the effects of just a medication if you continue the uh, ongoing you know, lifestyle uh, that you currently have. It needs to be you know, updated lifestyle, updated uh, dietary changes, updated exercises, along with this medication to truly reach the efficacy that we see here. So we're gonna start sort of with the um, headliners effectively. Um, so uh, semaglutide and liraglutide. So the two things I wanted to underline here is that, or the, the big thing I really wanted to underline here is that um, GLP-1 treatment for obesity is not by any means new. So liraglutide is also a uh, Sixenda. It was actually FDA approved for weight loss in December, 2014. So it's been around for almost 10 years. Um, and then semaglutide, which is Wagovi, um, is the one that we probably hear the most now because it's out in the media, was FDA approved since June of 2021. So these are by no means um, new medications. So let's go into sort of how they work. So um, GLP-1 analogs, uh, there are GLP-1 receptors in multiple organs throughout the body. So you're going to see a systemic effect of these medications. So um, as underlined here in this schematic, when you eat food, your small intestine is going to stimulate um, uh, secretion of GLP-1 and GIP. We're going to focus really on the effects of GLP-1 because that's the case for these medications. But effectively in the brain, it goes in and suppresses hunger. In the pancreas, it's going to increase insulin release and glucagon secretion. And it's going to cause a uh, gastric emptying, uh, sl slowing gastric emptying in the stomach as well. And this is all going to result in uh, increased satiety, um, uh, de uh, increased fullness, uh, decreased cravings, and uh, therefore weight loss ultimately. So a couple of things on, um, on uh, these GLP-1 analogs. So semaglutide is by and large the most effective uh, GLP-1 analog that we have between uh, uh, semaglutide and liraglutide, but it also is the uh, most efficacious anti-obesity medication that we have currently that's FDA approved. So in uh, large randomized control trials, patients receiving the maximum dose, the 2.4 milligram dose, um, lost a mean of 6% after week 12 and 12% by week 28. Um, also in the step eight trial, which is a series of trials that are uh, going on for semaglutide, um, it showed the significantly increased uh, body weight reduction of almost 16%, so 15.8% in semaglutide compared to about 6.4% in neuraglutide. So all this to say semaglutide is definitely the most efficacious we have at this time. Both medications are associated with an increased risk of pancreatitis and gallbladder disease. Um, semaglutide and to a certain point, also liraglutide is contraindicated in patients with personal or family history of medullary thyroid carcinoma or MEN2. Um, so what they found was that in specifically uh, rodent um, um, uh, uh, studies that there has been an associated increase in thyroid C cell tumors as well. Um, it's still unclear if this causes uh, thyroid cancer in uh, humans, um, but it is something that I have to discuss with patients regularly as well before we start this medication. 
Um, both medications uh, delay gastric emptying, so it does cause uh, nausea and vomiting for a good majority of people. And one other thing to kind of distinguish liraglutide from semaglutide is um, liraglutide is a daily injection, so that may sometimes sway some patients towards semaglutide, which is a weekly injection. So depending on how they feel about injections, that may sort of change the way you're, you're going to be going. So some common side effects, uh, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, constipation. You're going to see a lot of this in all of my slides. All, all of these medications cause some form of GI upset or can cause some form of GI upset. Um, abdominal pain, increased lipase, which causes the risk of, of uh, pancreatitis. They can get headache, fatigue, dizziness, um, hypoglycemia, and type 2 diabetes, mostly when, when uh, those patients are on other diabetic medications. So um, among diabetes treatments, semaglutide and liraglutide have lower incidences of hypoglycemia, but when combined with other medications, it can cause um, hypoglycemia. And then, of course, with decreased um, uh, gastric emptying, you can also get some increased reflux as well. So um, here, what you're going to be looking at is anywhere between 5 to 15 percent total body weight loss um, with, like I said, with uh, diet and exercise changes as well. So the next one we'll go through is fentramine and topiramate. So this is a medication that I was probably a little bit more scared of before I started to do a little bit more research on it. Um, it is uh, a good medication for a subset of, of patients, especially if um, you know the, the risk or the side effect profile is um, they're amenable to that as well. So um, fentramine and topiramate. Um, so fentramine is the immediate release aspect of it. It's a sympathomimetic. So what it does is it increases norepinephrine and epinephrine, which causes appetite suppression. So pyramate is an anti-epileptic um, uh, drug, so it's the extended release or the long-acting one. It has kind of an unclear mechanism, but they think it augments uh, GABA receptors um, and antagonizes glutamate and ultimately increases dopamine and serotonin, which causes fullness, um, decreased appetite, and decreased cravings. So um, this medication is, is favored in patients with comorbid migraines, so the topiramate aspect of the medication does help with those migraines. Um, but you do want to avoid it, though, in patients that have a history of cardiovascular disease or uncontrolled hypertension because of that fentramine aspect as well. Um, one important thing to note is that topiramate is teratogenic, so you definitely want to talk to your um, patients of childbearing age that they need to, to, to be careful and be on birth control as well, because if we're on this medication, then we have to take you off if you're pregnant. Um, so those are the things to, I mean, by and large, you're probably not going to put pregnant women on uh, anti-obesity medications, but just something to consider too for patients that may become pregnant. And then you want to make sure that you're measuring blood pressure and heart rate periodically. So I'll mention this in the next uh, medication as well, but I tend to have patients give me three days a week. So Monday morning, Wednesday afternoon, and Friday night um, uh, readings. And that way I can kind of get an idea of whether or not their blood pressures are trending upwards as well as their heart rate. So side effects, um, paresthesia, dizziness, dysgeusia, um, insomnia, constipation, and dry mouth. It can cause worsening anxiety. So fentramine does increase that, that feeling of anxiety. And uh, the papyramate aspect does have a risk of nephrolithiasis. So it's about a one in 50 um, risk of kidney stones, um, although some studies have challenged um, how effective that is, but it is something that you need to discuss with your patients as well. Um, so for these medications, you're looking at about a 5 to 10% total body weight loss, so a little bit less than GLP-1 receptor agonists, but definitely um, uh, great um, medications to include to increase that total body weight loss. So next up is naltrexone bupropion. <clears throat> so naltrexone bupropion, admittedly, I had to really kind of think about the, the mechanism of action for this one, but effectively, bupropion um, can activate anorexigenic neurons in the hypothalamus that cause decreased appetite and increased energy expenditure. Typically, this effect is not very effective because um, beta endorphins come back in and suppress that. It's an autoinhibitory loop. So they added naltrexone to antagonize the antagonist, and therefore this loop can continue with greater effect and therefore have decreased appetite and increased energy expenditure, which causes weight loss. So these medications are really favored in patients that are, um, <clears throat> excuse me, that are trying to quit smoking and or have depression. You want to try to avoid it, and you you want to avoid it absolutely in patients with seizure disorder because bupropion does reduce the um, seizure threshold and patients with uncontrolled hypertension. You want to use caution in patients that have increased risk of seizures because of that bupropion component. And then you're not going to use it concomitantly with um, opiates because naltrexone is going to negate any effects of opioids. So you want to make sure that you're considering that. 
And then for patients that may have comorbid psychiatric disorders, you want to make sure that you're avoiding it within 14 days of any um, MAO inhibitors as well. And again, this is another one that you're going to be measuring blood pressure and heart rate periodically, especially within the first three months. That's usually when you'll see some sort of effect on that as well. So side effects for this, again, GI upset, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, constipation, um, headaches, uh, dizziness, insomnia, and dry mouth as well. So sometimes these, this is um, the limiting factor for this medication at times. And here you're looking also at about 5 to 10% total body weight loss with diet and lifestyle modifications as well. So I would be remiss to have an anti-obesity medication lecture without at least mentioning terzepatide. So I did not have a full segment on terzepatide, terzepatide because it's not technically FDA approved for weight loss. Okay. So it's FDA approved for type two diabetes, which is Manjaro, um, but it is um, not quite yet FDA approved for weight loss, but it is certainly showing significant promise. So in, in July, 2022, New England Journal of Medicine um, uh, gave us this uh, lovely uh, uh, article that effectively concluded that all three doses of once weekly subcutaneous terzepatide led to clinically meaningful and sustained weight reduction in obese adults who did not have diabetes. Um, so the weight loss, the total body weight loss was like 20 or more percent. It was actually extremely impressive um, in this article. So it's one of those things that it is likely coming down the pike. Um, and I do think that uh, they will approve it, but we're still in that process of of kind of approval for it. Um, terzepatide, just to kind of round it out, though, I do like to underline the way that it works. So it's actually a dual GLP-1 and GIP agonist. So it effectively works similar to GLP-1 agonists in the brain, suppressing hunger, in the pancreas, increasing insulin release and glucagon secretion. It slows gastric emptying, but then it also increases fatty acid and glucose uptake within the fat tissue itself, um, causing uh, weight loss with this combine, combined effects. So going back to my patient and, and sort of wrapping up, so um, MP was agreeable to a uh, injectable medication. Uh, she had no contraindications, right? So no personal or family history of medullary thyroid carcinoma, no pancreatitis, no gallbladder disease. And I started her on Wigovi with a monthly up titration. Um, so the up titration is uh, everybody kind of treats it a little bit differently. There are some people that uh, do the up titration. There are some patients that can tolerate without the up titration. It's just the up titration tends to help with those GI side effects or help avoid those GI side effects. Um, so along with diet and exercise, my patient actually lost 16 pounds in the first six weeks, which she was extremely excited about. Um, we got a little bit limited in the last time we met with the one milligram dose. Uh, it, when we went up to 1.7, she had some diarrhea and some nausea. So we had to kind of go back to the one milligram dose. And my plan is to try to see if we can try to up titrate it again and see how she does with those um, with those side effects at that time, um, because the higher you go, the more um, weight loss you do get. So some take home points um, from this presentation. So anti-obesity med medications can be a long-term commitment. Um, so I say can be because it depends on what their BMI is starting at. Um, but it is a medica these are medications that are going to be around for a very long time and something that we're all going to have to eventually kind of uh, deal with, if not with the medication, then with their side effects. So it's just something to keep in mind. Um, take home points on the medication. So semaglutide and liraglutide, they are most efficacious and semaglutide definitely takes the cake for the most efficacious among these. Um, but you want to avoid them in patients with personal or family history of medullary thyroid carcinoma, um, personal history of pancreatitis or personal history of gallbladder disorder. For fentamine topiramate, uh, they're great for patients with comorbid migraines, but you want to try to avoid them in uncontrolled hypertension and in cardiovascular disease. Um, naltrexone, bupropion, ER, uh, great for comorbid uh, smoking, uh, patients who are smoking who want to stop smoking and or depression, but you want to make sure you're avoiding it in patients with seizure disorder. And then terzepatide uh, is showing great promise, but is still pending FDA approval for obesity treatment at this time. So I, I really want to take a quick minute just to acknowledge and say thank you to Dr. Sabrina Taldon and Dr. Victor Cueto. Um, they were both extremely helpful in uh, reviewing my presentation. This is the first time I do uh, Medicine Grand Round, so I was extremely nervous. So I really appreciate them uh, looking through and kind of helping me out with that. Um, and I have my references here. And with that, I'll go ahead and uh, take some questions. Thank you, Dr. Gonzalez. That was a very excellent presentation. It generated a lot of questions in the chat that you can refer to. Um, and uh, no need to be nervous. You're, we're all friends here. So that's great. Um, one thing, I, I, before I get to my uh, real question, I just want to ask you, what was the BMI of your patient? I didn't see the physical exam. Uh, how much 
How how 30, old was she? 32, 32. Okay. And I guess the the the, the question is um, um, new drugs are coming on the market every day. There's something called retrotrutide, which is actually a combination of Munjaro and glucagon together, uh, which is supposed to lead to be more powerful than Munjaro. But as we get more and more of these drugs, the question is, how does one uh, decide uh, that enough is enough? And if you stop the medicine, what's the likelihood of the patient to gain weight, especially if their lifestyle modifications haven't really been altered? Yeah, so um, they, they have shown that stopping abruptly, um, especially uh, semaglutide, um, so especially Wagovi, does increase um, their weight gain significantly. So it's I, I speak to my patients about that all the time, where I'm just like, if we if we reach a point, because a lot of my patients are, well, I don't have I don't want to take this medication forever, and I kind of tell them it's a chronic condition. It's definitely possible that you're going to be on this medication for the rest of your life. And if we were to get you off of it, we would need to titrate off with those lifestyle modifications. So it's, I, I will be honest, I don't know the statistics of how high, but it is known that if you stop these medications abruptly, that they will gain the weight back. Um, in terms of, um, I think the other question was about selecting it. I feel like a lot of times I am limited by what the insurance is going to cover, which has been my biggest frustration. <laughs> um, so sometimes I run into, well, semaglutide is a diabetes medication and this patient's not diabetic. And then I say, okay, well, then I want Wagovi instead, because that's a weight loss medication. It's FDA approved. And then they say, well, we don't cover weight loss medications. So I think the biggest frustration I sometimes come across is, is, um, is insurances, which I think, especially as a new physician, I'm learning my way around it. I'm, I'm doing a lot of appeals for people that I really do feel should be on this medication and, and will benefit from it is kind of how I've been trying to approach it. Um, I, I will say if anybody has any input on how they approach that, I would, I would love to know. Um, but that's sort of how I've been uh, doing it, but I am a little bit limited by that. I also like to talk to the patients about these side effects and if they are amenable to it, that's typically how I start to select it. Um, I will probably push more for more effective weight loss medications for those patients that I know have more comorbidities. So semaglutide has been one that if patients have, you know, they're in the pre-diabetic range, they're getting close to that diabetes range, they have the hyperlipidemia, they have the hypertension, um, and they their, their BMI is even greater, I am kind of pushing more towards that because that's our, our greatest shot effectively. Dr. Marcus, you have a question in the chat. Oh, I mean, my question was just... Um... The guidelines, did they say like how long you've got to show that you really tried the lifestyle modification before they would recommend it? I mean, I guess that would affect approval. Yeah. So I, I, in reading a couple of them, it seems like three to six months is kind of, but by the guidelines, they don't necessarily really give a firm cutoff. It's usually just like if it's not effective. And then I, I was even trying to see like what percentage of total body weight loss are we talking with like not effective. And most places are anywhere between three to, if we can't get at least 3% of total body weight loss within that time, it's usually considered ineffective. My, my cutoff personally in my practice is usually about six months. If I know you're doing six months of guided, I know the stuff you're doing and it's not working, I'll kind of start to look into and discuss at least the medications. And then I'm just, I'll, I can read the rest of them too. So anti-obesity effective oral. So oral semaglutide is, I, 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 I will say, um, Dr. Weiss, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I believe it's not yet, F, it's not FDA approved for weight loss. It's just the Wigovi that is FDA approved for weight loss. I don't believe the oral one is, um, but it does have, I think it's, I think it's less effective, but I do not want to comment too much on that. And that one I'm not too sure about. Well, how would you handle a patient that comes to see you whose BMI is 26, let's say, and uh, this patient, I won't say what gender, let's say, but just this 26-year-old patient and really wants to lose 10 pounds and they've tried everything they could possibly do, would you consider starting them on this medicine? I have had this directly happen to me <laughs> for a couple of my patients. Um, I. I, it depends for me on their comorbidities. If they're otherwise healthy and their BMI is 26, I usually recommend against these medications. Kind of what I tell them is similarly, like we are gonna start you on these medications and this is a very long-term commitment for having, um, uh, you know, for this is a very long-term commitment for something that I don't think is gonna give you as many benefits as much as risks. We have risks of side effects and of keeping you on this medication long-term. 
So I tend to kind of go more the route of like, I'll refer to nutrition. I discuss with them things like uh, workout regimens that, you know, like getting a personal trainer in the, in, in the gym is sometimes, uh, sometimes more effective. So I look at alternatives to them versus the medications, I will admit. I don't disagree with you, but I think in the real world, you'll get patients that will keep pushing and pushing you until you, and if not you, they'll find somebody else who will prescribe the medicine for them. And the question is, is it better in your expert hands uh, or is it better that they go and find somebody who um, will see them on a telemedicine visit and you know charge them a certain amount of money and then just prescribe the drug? I don't know, you know, but what the answer is, uh, but I, I'm interested. I'm glad to hear your perspective. Thank you so much. Oh, Dr. Chediak has a question. And then yes, I went to the question first. Great job, Janellis. I really enjoyed it and learned a, a lot today. And my question is that it, correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounds like the, with the rebound and the things we've been talking about lately, in the last five minutes, it's been mostly about the GLP-1 and similar drugs. Do you see that same rebound of weight gain with the other uh, drugs that you mentioned, anti-obesity drugs? Yeah, so you do have some rebound as well with them. The, the bigger sort of concern, which I, I didn't mention as well, but like the fentramine topiramate, if you have them at a very high dose for a few weeks, you want to make sure that you're down, like kind of trending it down slowly because it does, uh, it can precipitate a seizure. So it's something to consider. So all of the medications by and large should be weaned down if you are going to take them off, uh, but they do have some effect of, of, because the idea is now that appetite suppression, that fullness, that satiety is gone. So if they're not kind of really seeing how much they're eating and controlling how much they're eating, they are going to gain that weight. So it's more of like a that that suppression is no longer there. And that happens with all of them. But to appear is very dangerous if you just take them off of it altogether. So they need to know that they need to wean it off. OK, thank you very much. Absolutely. Let's thank move you. On to our next introduction, Dr. Osego. Thank you, Dr. Weiss. Uh, thank you, Dr. Gonzalez. Congratulations on your presentation. Uh, now it's my honor to introduce our second round round speaker, Dr. Mario Bilusic. Uh, he's a board certified medical oncologist who focuses on genitourinary tumors. Uh, his current research interests focus on tumor immunology and the development of novel immunotherapy approaches for prostate cancer and other GU tumors using therapeutic cancer vaccines, antibodies, immune modulators, or immune checkpoint inhibitors, not only as monotherapies, but also in combination with other therapies uh, as part of his immuno-oncology programmatic effort. Um, Dr. Belusic received his uh, MD degree from the University of Zagreb a School of Medicine in Croatia uh, and completed his PhD training uh, in Croatia as well at the University of Split. Uh, in addition, he completed a postdoc research fellowship in physiological genomics at the Medical College of Wisconsin. He successfully completed a, a hemon fellowship at the National Cancer Institute in Bethesda, Maryland. Uh, Dr. Belusic served as an assistant professor uh, genitourinary medical oncology at the Fox Chase Cancer Center, and then joined the NCI, genitourinary malignancy branch in 2016 as associate research physician. Uh, during that time at the NCI, he also served as the program director of the hematology oncology fellowship. And then um, he went on to, um, uh, to become a, NIH Hematology Oncology Fellowship, Fellowship Team uh, Director's Award. Um, he has a passion for teaching and mentoring, and he has earned multiple awards at the NIH and the NCI. Uh, in July 2021, we were lucky enough to have him join our Sylvester Comprehensive Cancer Center at our university, uh, where he leads the, genitor the genitourinary side disease group. So it is my pleasure to leave you guys with uh, Dr. Belusic who's going to teach us about the advances in metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer treatment. Thank you for the introduction. It's my pleasure to be here today and share with you in the next 20 minutes or so what is new in the metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer. So a just brief introduction to prostate cancer in the United States is about 288,000 new cases, 34, almost 35,000 deaths. It's about one in nine of men will be diagnosed with prostate cancer during his lifetime. Average age is getting younger, it used to be 70s, now shifting to mid 60s, and it's more likely to happen in African American men. The risk of dying is a, 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 approximately one in 40, and about five years survival is at 31%. 
So uh, this uh, dread trend graph shows here what is happening with the incidence and the mortality of the prostate cancer. You can see here there's a peak in mid uh, 1990s with the introduction of PSA screening, but uh, on the mortality hasn't changed. So, you know, even though we diagnosed three times more people with prostate cancer, we didn't impact mortality, did not increase, did not improve. What we noticed is there's decrease in mortality like in mid 2000 uh, and till 2015 to 2020, you can see about 33% decrease. And that is thanks to new discovered new drugs that we have today available. Uh, prostate cancer is very heterogeneous disease, and there are some people who have a slowly growing disease and never die of disease, and there's some people who develop metastatic disease, the novel metastatic disease, and they die very quickly. Uh, initial treatment is radiation or surgery. About 20 to 40 percent of patients will fail the primary treatment and present with biochemical recurrence, which we detect by measuring PSA after the surgery. About 5 percent of patients will have a distant metastatic disease or diagnose what we call the novel metastatic disease. And then in those patients, uh, once they are metastatic, the goal is to control the disease uh, and maintaining quality of life. So what we usually do is uh, put them on hormonal therapy. Uh, initially, everybody responds to hormonal therapy. Duration of response is variable between the patient. And then eventually everybody progresses to uh, hormone-resistant prostate cancer. And that is going to be uh, the main topic of today's discussion. So this slide here summarizes everything what we have for prostate cancer. So prostate cancer, everything what you want to know on one slide. So it's a very busy slide, but basically on the left side, you have tumor volume over time, non-metastatic, metastatic, castration sensitive, castration resistant, and all the approved drugs for each one of this uh, condition at each stage. So most recently, you know, here on the right side, we have a couple of uh, uh, as precision oncology approval in 2017 with pembrolizumab, then recuperate or operate for uh, the um, homologous recombination repair mutation, and most recently, lutetium um, 170 as of last year. Castration resistant disease, and that's typically what always I ask to ask fellows and residents, like how we define castration resistant disease. It's basically progression of prostate cancer despite being on hormonal therapy and having testosterone level less than 50. They can present either continuous PSA rise in levels, progression of pre existing disease, or appearance of new metastases. And uh, the problem is that this is a deadly stage of prostate cancer. All this hormone-sensitive disease, nobody ever dies from prostate cancer. They die with prostate cancer or something else. But once patient develops castration-resistant disease, this is that sentence. Everybody dies from this disease. And no matter what we do, all the approvals I will share with you, there are minimum improvement in our life expectancy, which is currently between two to three years. So uh, there is another paradigm shift. So first paradigm shift, unfortunately, everybody who develops castration-resistant prostate cancer will die from the prostate cancer. And the second shift, we are shifting away from PSA as a main indicator of something is happening with the prostate cancer. It's very difficult for the oncologist, but even more difficult for the patient because till this moment, PSA was the holy grail. Use PSA to detect the cancer, use PSA to uh, check how it's patient doing after surgery, use PSA to see how they're doing when they're developing hormone sensitive disease. But once they reach metastatic castration resistant disease, PSA is just one of the parameters. The most important parameter is actually CAT scan and bone scan, radiographic imaging, and then patient symptoms. Do they have more pain? Do they lose weight? The PSA rise alone is not sufficient indicator. It's not sufficient for us to change the treatment because we have limited treatment options and we can easily run through all seven treatment options we have available, eight in a very short period of time and patient run out of option. And frequently I see patient consultation, the oncologist community run through the, through the option because patients are very anxious with PSA going from, you know, 100 to 101, and they keep changing all these treatment options. And then it's a lot of education to oncologists in the community, as well as a patient that PSA rise alone is not sufficient to change the treatment. If the patient is tolerating treatment, cancer stable, and patient is clinically doing very well. So here, there's a list of all approved uh, treatment options for castration resistant prostate cancer, and it's all happened in the last decade. So when I was a fellow, the only one approved, which was early one, was Dositoxel based on TAC327, and it was very easy to pass medical oncology board exams. 
It was very easy answer. Docetaxel was the only answer we had. Now becomes much, much more complicated. There are a lot of treatment options available. And then what is the most uh, problem uh, practicing oncologists is that we do not know how to select of this uh, manual list of treatment options. Uh, there's no trials to guide us. Okay, you should use this drug first and then that one. So we have some retrospective data. And then when we make a decision, we take in consideration several factors. We take the first factor is like, you know, efficacy, what patient comorbidities, what insurance options are, how fast things are changing, uh, what is, you know, is there visceral crisis versus just lymph nodes versus bones. So there are multiple uh, factors in patient presentation that will uh, guide us one treatment option versus another treatment option. Since I don't have enough time to cover all the treatment options available for castration-resistant prostate cancer. I just highlight a couple of those that they are very unique for prostate cancer or they are most, most novel one for the prostate cancer. So one of the most unique one is active cellular immunotherapy. Cipelucil T was approved in 2011 and it's autologous dendritic solid tumor vaccine and it's only one and the first one ever approved. That was the beginning of immuno-oncology revolution uh, that basically patient uh, undergo harvesting on or dendritic cells and those dendritic cells are then processed in the facility for three days, exposed to prostatic acid phosphatase and gr granulocyte macrophage uh, colony stimulating factor. And they're been basically reinfused back to a patient. So it's labor intense, autologous individual patient vaccine uh, reinfused to patient. And then this uh, phase three studies go impact uh, trial was published in 2010. And Dr. Kantov from Memorial at the time was the key uh, investigator showed that people who received three doses of this vaccine compared to placebo had an improval over survival about 4.1 months. But what was the most interesting was looking in later on when they did analysis of all this trial subgroup analysis. It was no pre-planned analysis. It's subgroup analysis. It was for hypothesis generating. The people who have a lower PSA had dramatically better improvement over survival compared to people who have a higher PSA, which indicates higher disease volume, which makes sense because less tumor burden somebody has those people live longer, have more chance, have more intact immune system, and there is logically they're going to have more benefit for, from this kind of intervention. So today, when you're following guidance, how to treat prostate cancer patient, we prescribe a cipolustal T for patients who are minimally symptomatic, asymptomatic, castration resistant, and ideally you want to capture patients when they have PSA less than 20. The next drug, which is unique for prostate cancer, is radium-223. That was a drug that was caught all of us by surprise when it got approved in 2015, because you know, usually you know, we go on ASCO meetings, you see drugs in a clinical trial, what are the developments, so you kind of feel what is going to happen a drug, and a drug looks promising, is going to get approved, so nobody was very excited about a particular drug because you heard maybe in a couple of years ago on the ASCO meeting. This one was caught everybody was a surprise because they went from phase one to phase three, they were not publishing or talking a lot about it, and they just presented the results of the trial and it was a positive study. So basically, radium-223 uh, is a radioactive isotope given intravenously. And if you're looking for this uh, you know, category on the left side, you can see the calcium, strontium, barium, radium is in the same column. And this uh, you know, the diagram indicating that radium is bone-seeking uh, metal, and the one is infused to a patient, goes to bone marrow, and emits alpha particles, which is different than gamma, gamma radiation or beta particles. The alpha particles have very short half-life, and they have very short penetrance, only a few microns. So basically, alpha particles, they uh, kill uh, the cancer cells and some stem cells, of course, around the area where they are infused, uh, and then basically kills the cancer, improves pain, uh, leads to PSA decline. And what was the most interesting was the phase three study of Alcimca that basically randomized patient uh, to radium-223 uh, plus best supportive care. So some people were receiving hormonal therapy during this time versus placebo. And it was given total of uh, six session, uh, four weeks apart. And they used patient who had mostly bone disease, the radium-223 doesn't go to lymph nodes, doesn't go to liver, so those patients will not have benefit from, from the treatment. So predominantly bone disease, 
and they, they look for survival of those patients. And it was a positive study with uh, an improvement in median overall survival, uh, which in rating group reaches 14.9 months and has a ratio was significant, uh, 0.7, which led to approval of this age in 2015 for castration-resistant prostate cancer, uh, predominantly, predominantly bone. This is the, uh, the table, safety table from New England paper uh, published in 2013, showing that a uh, majority of, it's very well tolerated, the majority of side effects you are, are hematologic because the drug goes, radium goes to bone marrow, and there's a transient decline in neutrophil count and platelet count and hemoglobin mandating the FDA that before we initiate the treatment, patients should have hemoglobin of at least 10 and uh, platelet count of 100,000 because of the risk of her decline during the treatment. Uh, the other side effects are mostly a gastrointestinal drug is getting ex, uh, secreted through the uh, fecal material. There's some precaution the patient should take, uh, you know, washing their uh, underwear separately, flushing toilet uh, twice instead of once, and make sure that, you know, patient gets admitted, there's a proper handling of patient secretion uh, in the hospital. So, uh, Shifting gears to personalized cancer therapy, this is what is novel in the prostate cancer. And basically here on this slide, you can see that, you know, one treatment fits all approach, which we use for many of our cancers through uh, decades. Now we are learning more that this is not one type of prostate cancer, it's not one type of lung cancer. There are many subtypes. They behave biologically differently prognosis is different, they have different target, different driving mutation, therefore treatments should be different. So we are making slowly progress in prostate cancer. We are still behind lung cancer, but we are getting there. So um, one of the pivotal papers was this paper published in 2015 from Cell showing that, uh, you know, it was a West Coast Dream Team analyzed biopsies, molecular profiling of 150 patients with castration resistant disease and looking which are most common mutation in patients. So if they found that AR mutation and amplification is the most common one in castration resistant prostate cancer, almost 62%, two thirds of patients have this mutation, followed by TP53 deletion, P10 deletion, RB1 loss, BRCA1, BRCA2 was detected in 14% of the patient and CDK, uh, I'm sorry, CDK12 mutation uh, was also one of the most common ones. What was surprising was to discover that BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutation was much higher than initially we thought is happening in the prostate cancer. We always felt maybe a few percent of patients will have BRCA1 or BRCA2. And we were thinking that based on, on germline uh, sequencing, germline testing. However, after this paper, there's a lot of interest in BRCA1, BRCA2, ATM, and other genes from DNA repair pathway mechanism and a drug development targeting those particular mutations. So in terms of germline testing, one in 10 men will have met, uh, with metastatic prostate cancer will have germline DNA repair mutation. So um, this was the also one of the paper from the uh, 2016 indicating the most common one germline mutation is was BRCA1, BRCA2, followed by ATM, CHECK2, uh, which are basically in the vast majority of patients. And knowing germline mutation can help us not necessarily treat the patient because we can always do somatic testing and check for somatic mutation, but mostly it's going to help testing the family and referring those patients to genetic counselors. So their family will be, if they have a gene, will be then screened on different, you know, different uh, frequency and different timing much earlier than usually we would screen or not even screen patients with for prostate cancer. This uh, slide summarizes currently the most interesting topic of research for prostate cancer. And you know there are three main categories. There are uh, microsatellite instability or patients who have you know, Lynch syndrome that those patients can give checkpoint inhibitors. They are patients with mutation in DNA repair pathways like a CHECK2, ATM, ATR, BRCA1, BRCA2. And then a new area of research interest is the patient with CDK12 inactivation mutation. Those patients are also uh, uh, have you know, increased response to immune checkpoint inhibitors. There is no yet approved drug for this uh, inactivation. It's a currently part of the research. So what happened in 2017 was approval of pembrolizumab 
first ever approval of anti-cancer agent, regardless of uh, organ of origin. So, um, the you know they did a they did a study. They identified patients with different cancers who have microsatellite instability, and they tested with pembrolizumab, and um, they uh, FDA got approval, uh, including the prostate cancer. Even though in this uh, paper was only two patients with prostate cancer, and one of them responded, one of them did not respond. So 50% out of two, but that was sufficient to FDA to approve because it was across the board. You can see that there's a between 50 and 100% response rate if patients have microsatellite instability. So in prostate cancer, we microsatellite instability uh, goes between 2% to 12%. So it's really, you know, depends on the series we are following, uh, but more advanced patient, uh, you know, in autopsy series, you know, it was about up to 12%. So because of this uh, approval and drug we have available, we are required to test all our patients with metastatic disease, do molecular profiling for microsatellite instability and tumor mutational burden, because if they have microsatellite high prostate cancer, we should be able to prescribe them pembrolizumab and that's the FDA approved agent. And this is the uh, paper published by Dr. Bida and JAMA Oncology in 2019, uh, actually telling us a little bit more, and this is more only a prostate cancer. The previous paper was all comer with microsatellite instability. This paper is focusing on, on prostate cancer only. So you can see they had a thousand patient sequence. They find microsatellite uh, instability in about 32, about 3%. And then um, they treated them and they found that about 50% of those patients did respond, had prolonged response uh, in a several years to pembrolizumab. Uh, confirming the uh, need for molecular seek processing, molecular uh, profiling, and offering pembrolizumab uh, to a patient. Um, shifting gears to um, DNA repair pathway drugs and mutations. So this was the very important trial called PROFOUND3 uh, that are using laparoid versus physician choice of patient who had castration-resistant prostate cancer. And they had patient in two cohorts. The cohort A has BRCA1, BRCA2, and ATM alteration. Cohort B had other alteration listed here in the red on this slide. So there are about 12 different alteration of 12 different genes involved in this pathway. And basically they gave patient a laparoid or physician choice of therapy. And then if patient progressed, on the physician choice of therapy, they will be able to be given uh, all operate, uh, the crossover to a laparoid arm. And trial was very positive, particularly on the cohort A, patient with BRCA1, BRCA2, and ATM, with dramatic improvement in overall uh, progression-free survival and overall survival, almost double it with hazard ratio 0 0.34 which then led to approval of uh, all operate for patients with uh, castration-resistant prostate cancer. I did not put a slide because new approval which just came out last week. Uh, they basically approved all operate in a combination with Averaderon for, as a frontline therapy for patients with uh, BRCA1, BRCA2, and ATM mutation, indicating synergistic activity between Averaderon and BRCA uh, and uh, all operate in this patient population. So uh, the final analysis also showed in overall population and in cohort A, there's a positive impact of this treatment. Therefore, we are frequently now, as of you know, last two years, uh, prescribing this uh, medication for our patient with castration-resistant prostate cancer if they harbor one of these three mutations. And in terms of side effects, the Olaparib has several side effects, mostly it's hematologic toxicity. It's been around for many years for ovarian and breast cancer. So we as oncologists are very comfortable managing side effects and prescribing it. One of the you know, package insertion is that there is a 1% risk of developing um, myelodysplastic syndrome or AML by affecting the uh, bone marrow. Uh, however, that was not observed in the prostate cancer studies. Uh, we are debating maybe that was the reason, you know, those patients did not receive cisplatin-based agent as ovarian cancer patient did. However, that time will tell us more uh, about this uh, side effects. However, we always tell the patient potential risk of developing MDS or ML if they're treated with Olaparib. And the last drug I would like to share a few slides with you is a uh, the lutetium PSMA617. So PSMA is a protein highly expressed in prostate cancer and including metastatic disease as you know, 
was found to be very good a potential target for uh, molecular therapy and PET imaging. So last year we had approval of PSMA PET targeting metastatic disease, which is much more sensitive uh, by detecting metastatic disease compared to conventional bone scan and the CAT scan. And then um, there are some other organs that they can express PSMA, mostly lacrimal glands and salivary glands, and there's some expression in the kidneys. And then lutetium is radioactive isotope, uh, you know, it's binding to PSMA, and they have very high affinity targeting beta particles. So comp comparing to radium to two, three, it's alpha particle, this is beta particle, it has a little bit longer penetrance, uh, the, the length wave. And that's what studied in a vision uh, trial here in the United States that took the patient who received chemotherapy and one antiandrogen. So this is a, was a third line therapy and they randomized patient to lutetium every six weeks for four cycles compared to standard therapy, whatever protocol allowed, which was a, a alternative treatment. And they're observing patient for their responses. And this was a positive study, both progression-free survival and overall survival was improved and overall survival was approved uh, almost four months in patients who receive lutetium PSMA uh, uh, treatment plus standard of care, which led to approval of this drug uh, last year for the patient with castration resistant prostate cancer if they uh, failed two prior lines of therapy. It was relatively safe compared to standard of care. The only one which uh, is a little bit strikingly different. It's dry mouth, basically it affects salivary glands. So people have xerostomia as one of the side effects, although most of them as grade one or grade two xerostomia. So this is the sum finally summarized table of all approved agents. So since 2010, all of those drugs got approved. And when you're looking for improvement in overall survival here, you can see that every of this agent approves survival for two months to four months. So we would like to see more dramatic improvement in overall survival. Like, you know, as I said, like castration resistant prostate cancer is a very deadly disease. And all these improvements are there. They are FDA approved, but we would like to see agents that they can improve survival more than four months. But this is yet to be seen. So in summary, a uh, couple of key messages, which I think are important for all of us taking care of prostate cancer patient that a frequently patient will ask and somebody will ask, oh, if patient has hormone resistant disease, why we have to continue hormonal therapy if it's hormone resistant? Well, the studies have shown that intermittent hormon, uh, hormonal therapy is associated with worse outcomes. So even patient that has hormone resistant disease, we have to continue with the hormonal therapy. We have to do molecular profiling for all patients with castration-resistant prostate cancer because of this precision medication, precision oncology medication we can offer to our patient. Life expectancy is still two to three years, and we have to set expectation when we talk to our patients. And then there are no clear data on treatment sequence, but based on the studies I share with you, we can have some clues which drug we use first. So if patient has uh, is asymptomatic, low disease burden, no liver metastasis. Uh, um, we can provide them cipolucil T. We usually start with abiraterone and zalutamide. It's anti-androgen. I didn't talk about the studies because uh, you know they've been around uh, and we have uh, limited time today to talk about uh, the treatment option. We use chemotherapy for patients with the rapidly progressive with visceral disease, with liver and lung metastasis who are more symptomatic. First, we try with docetaxel, then we follow with cabazitaxel, which is second line hormonal therapy. Radium-223, we give to patients who have predominantly bone disease and no visceral metastasis. We do not combine with abiraterone because uh, there was a data showing that it can lead to increased risk of fractures if we combine abiraterone with radium-223. Rucaparib-olaparib approved for patients with uh, DNA repair pathway mutation, and they are usually given up as second line or third line therapy. And then lutetium-117 uh, is approved for patient as third line therapy with castration resistant disease. And there are many more drugs in development that are going to be probably presented at some uh, next time. So with all this, I think we still have five or six, five minutes or so for the some questions, if there are any. Thank you so much for attention. Thank you, Dr. Elizabeth, for this very enlightening grand rounds. We appreciate your review of this topic. One thing that um, seems to pop up with prostate cancer more than others is the, the racial disparities associated 
with prostate cancer and the aggressiveness that is seen in certain so uh racial and certain ethnic groups does that in any way influence for example black males does that influence your choice of therapies or the way in which you approach these patients so absolutely so the black men they actually have much worse prostate cancer outcome so it's not only that the incidence is or they have disease at earlier stage they have more aggressive disease they survive all these lives so definitely biology is different and many of them may have limited access to medication. You know, in terms of the treatment, we still tend to treat patients similarly, offering them all the available treatment options. But I think in terms of the screening and preventive action and uh, things, we have to be more aggressive and you know, screen those patients because official recommendation not to screen for prostate cancer unless they are African-American or they have strong family history. So I think as being present and trying to detect it early, uh, we tend to be more, and I personally tend to be more aggressive managing those patients, seeing them more frequently because they tend to progress faster. Thank you. Dr. Lakakis, would you like to close with your final question? Yes. Uh, so, uh, Mario, you, you mentioned that uh, apart from androgen receptor mutations, uh, the variant 7, uh, you, we have uh, P10 uh, deletions, uh, very frequent somatic uh, P10 deletions. Uh, have they tried uh, PI3K? or uh, AKT or mTOR inhibitors to block this pathway. So that's a, that's a currently uh, active area of research. You know, so some studies, you know, demonstrate the, the positive outcomes, some are negative. We also have uh, the cycling CDK for six inhibitors in the phase three clinical trial. So uh, the absolutely uh, very active in terms of research. The focus of this grand round was just to talk about approved uh, agents, which we use in the clinic. But great, Thanks. great question, Lazaro. Okay, well, thank you very much. Both of our presenters gave very nice lectures. We appreciate them both. Please refer to the chat for the link to the MOC and MEC credits and uh, wishing everybody a great day and we'll see you next week. Be safe. Thank you.